you know, so I think you can go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for uh, joining this session of the Virtual Seminars in Economic Theory. Today we have Quidde uh, Valenzuela Stuki, who is going to present the paper Screening and Information Sharing Externalities. Uh, we're very pleased to have Marina Halatz and Daniel Rappaport as uh, guest panelists. The format of this uh, seminar is as follows. We have a 60-minute presentation with uh, time for interim questions from the panelists, followed by a 15-minute session for questions and discussion. We request all attendees to keep your microphones muted during the talk. However, please post comments and questions in the chat. There will be an opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A session at the end. The talk is recorded. Before I hand over to Quidze, let me uh, remind you that these seminars take place every Thursday at 4 p.m. UK time. Next time we'll have uh, with us Christoph Wolf, uh, who's going to present his paper, uh, A Quest for Knowledge with uh, Johannes Schneider. And guest panelists are Stephen Callender and Florian Eder. As usual, you can find more information on our website or by following us on Twitter. Thank you, Quidze, the mic is uh, yours. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna post right now the slides in the chat for people who just came in. Um, great, yeah, so thank you all for coming. I'm excited to be talking about this with you all. This is a kind of very much in progress. So comments are of any scale are very welcome. And also, I mean, apologies if, if you've looked at the paper, it's, it's kind of in flux at the moment. So hopefully I can make things clear today. Right. So in this paper, I'm interested in the role of transparency in repeated negotiations involving many agents. So this is a, is a topic that has implications for many significant policy debates. So for example, um, pay secrecy and confidentiality, confidentiality practices by firms. So these are instances, instances in which firms either require workers not to discuss their compensation with coworkers or punish workers for discussing their compensa compensation. So these types of practices are illegal in the US and other countries, but persist in many instances. Now the, the stated reasons for these anti-PSC regulations are twofold generally. So one is to help workers know their value to the firm so that they'll be able to negotiate appropriate compensation. And the other reason often given is to prevent pay discrimination. The idea being that if workers can observe each other's wages, they'll be able to identify when the firm is discriminating against some workers. And so a natural question is, does pay transparency or this type of anti-PSC regulation achieve these goals? And this is the kind of application that I'll return to at the end. Um, and discuss kind of explicitly these different factors. But this general question is relevant in other settings. So for example, the disclosure of payer negotiated, negotiated rates between hospitals and insurers. So hospitals negotiate with insurers over the rates for which they'll be compensated for various services. And new regulation from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the US would require hospitals to disclose these rates. So the question is, how will this type of disclosure affect the negotiation of the rates? So what I'll do in this paper is study a general model with a single long lived agent who has some private information. So this would be the firm or the hospital in the previous examples. And there are gonna be multiple long lived principles. So these would be the workers or the insurers. There are gonna be multiple periods in which the agent engages in simultaneous bilateral negotiations with the principals. And then some principals may observe others past bargaining outcomes. So this is the role of transparency. Just to kind of give a preview of what we'll see, let me say that screening by the principal is gonna be roughly speaking, the principal bargaining hard to try to learn the agent's type. So the key findings in the general model are gonna to relate to a complementarity in screening by the principles and a certain fragility of screening, which I'll discuss in us in a second. I'm then gonna consider explicitly an application to pay discrimination. And so here there are gonna be firms who engage in pay discrimination and 
verifiable cases of pay discrimination would be penalized, where verifiability here refers to the type of evidence that needs to be presented in order to punish the firm for discrimination. And here I'll show that penalties for discrimination cannot eliminate discrimination regardless of the degree of transparency. So this is a partial negative result. However, they may facilitate redistribution. And kind of a takeaway here is that it's not gonna be enough to just penalize redistribution or penalize discrimination. We're also gonna to wanna to reward anti-discrimination. And I'll discuss that when we get there. Just to kind of emphasize the general takeaways. So from a practical perspective, I think one of the important kind of portable pieces of intuition that comes out of this analysis is a complementarity in screening. And so the idea is that when more principles screen, again, when more principles kind of try to learn the firm's type early on, the more principles do this, the more willing the agent will be to allow additional principles to screen. So formally, this is gonna come from a, this is gonna represent a supermodularity of the agent's payoffs. This type of complementarity also acts on the, on the side of the, of the principles. So the information rents paid by each principle in order to screen are gonna be lower when more screen. So these are obviously very closely related. Now, from a more technical perspective, this, there's gonna be kind of an important um, feature of equilibria, this screening fragility. So this means that the, the supermodularity of the agent's payoffs are gonna apply a, an extreme reaction by the agent to deviations by the principles. So actually, if a single principle who is supposed to screen in equilibrium deviates, no principles are gonna be able to screen. So this is a statement about kind of off path behavior, or which incentive constraints bind in equilibrium. And it's gonna simplify the equilibrium characterization, but it's also gonna have important kind of practical on path implications, especially to the anti-discrimination regulation. So we'll see how that comes in later on. Very briefly, um, in the discussion of related literature. So the paper is related to reputation games and that the payoffs of the informed agent in the continuation game will, will depend on what their actions reveal about, about their type early on. Now an important difference between this paper and kind of most of this literature is really here, I'm not gonna be interested in kind of long run or limiting behavior. I'm gonna be interested in characterizing the, the, the characterizing fully behavior in, in, a, in a short run game um, with kind of a, fic, a fixed game. So um, we're also, this is also gonna be related to the common agency literature. So they're here, they're kind of multiple principles simultaneously engaged in some type of screening with an agent. Um, and the important contribution here is to identify this transparency induced complementarity in screening by the principles. And finally, there's also a conceptual relationship between this paper and the multi-agent strategic experimentation literature. So actually kind of one way to understand what's going on here is you can think of it a bit like a, a strategic experimentation model where the cost of experimentation is gonna be endogenous so determined by the information rents paid to the agent. Okay. So I'm happy to discuss kind of related literature more at the end. So for today, I'm gonna to start by presenting a simple, simple model and then discussing equilibrium in this model and finally looking at the application to discrimination. So I'm going to, in the paper, I study kind of a more general model, but for today, for concreteness and clarity, I'm gonna illustrate all the kind of main results in the context of a, of a specific uh, simple game. And then at the end, I mean, hopefully as we go through, you'll see kind of what are the important pieces. And at the end, I'll clarify exactly what I think the important pieces are. Ethan, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So uh, just before you get into the model, uh, you, you know, mentioning this literature, a big, the big force in the experimentation literature that you mentioned seems to be the opposite of complementarity, right? It's like freeloading on other people's experimentation, but you're saying it's complementarity here. Complementary here. So I wondered if there's a simple way to comment on that, uh, that despair, that difference right now, or if you could delay it if later. Yeah, I mean, so there is still kind of a free riding effect in that workers who don't screen, who don't kind of try to learn the firm's type on their own will benefit from the fact that others may. Um, and this will kind of increase their incentive not to. 
the complementarity is is kind of I see it as affecting the costs of experimentation, and so mm -hmm. the cost will be lower when more more other workers screen. Um, but I may also benefit when more other workers screen exactly because I'm more likely to get information from them if I don't screen. Um, so when you say complementarity, you don't mean that net is complementary. You mean uh, there's this extra complementary effect because the agent is a yeah. strategic e agent. Yeah, okay. exactly, exactly. So I think, I think that's a helpful clarification. All right, so in this simple model, it's gonna be two periods and a finite set of principles. And I'm gonna to refer to these principles as workers. Mm -hmm. and there's gonna be a single agent. So this is gonna to refer to as a firm. So some people may be bothered by the fact that workers are screening the firm. Again, kind of the motivation here is, is this type of um, pay secrecy regulation. And so kind of the explicit reason given for this is that firms have some private information about how valuable workers are. So the firm has yeah, here private information about the val its value for workers. So particularly the kind of per worker per period output of the firm is gonna be their high or low. And this is the firm's private type. So workers will assign probability P ex ante to the firm being the high type. Now here I'm gonna assume, I'm assuming workers are symmetric but it's not important. So the same general results are gonna hold if workers have different levels of, of productivity provided high type firm still means that more, we're all workers more productive at that firm. So the firm's payoffs are gonna be additively separable across workers and across time. So their per worker per period payoff is just the output minus the wage paid to that worker. And their payoff from a worker who's not employed is zero. The worker's payoff is gonna be additively separable across time. So their per period payoff is just their wage. They're going to have an outside option, which I'll say is negative D in each period. The timing is as follows. So in the first period, there's going to be simultaneous bilateral. Sorry, will it be relevant that you said the outside option to be negative? So D here can be positive or negative? So D can, I'm going to assume is positive. It's not, it's, it's not relevant for kind of the analysis. It's useful to rule out kind of trivial um, situations. I so, see, it's a bit uncommon. So can I think of it as being zero? You could or think of it as being zero. Right? Okay. Um, it's just helpful to have an extra degree of freedom to kind of make sure that we avoid trivial equilibria without kind of affecting other parameters of the model. Um, okay, okay. You could think I will of say. It as zero. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. So in the first period, we have simultaneous bilateral negotiations. And so these particular workers are going to make an initial, you know, each worker is going to, workers simultaneously make an initial offer of a wage. And the firm chooses whether to accept or reject each offer. And then if the firm rejects an offer, the firm makes a counter offer. And the worker can choose whether to accept or reject. If this is rejected, then there's no agreement that period and the worker remains unemployed. And the worker and the firm discount at some rate delta between offers. Very simple bargaining game. Now, after the first period, there's going to be some information sharing where workers may observe some information about other workers' first period contracts. I'll return to this on the next slide. And then there's going to be another round of negotiations. And here I'm just going to assume that in this in the second round, the worker makes a take it or leave it offer to the firm. So the fact that the worker in the second period has all the bargaining power is not important. What, what's kind of really matters is that here the, the firm will be better off if the worker believes that the firm is the low type and worse off if the worker believes that the firm is the high type. But it does seem reasonable that the worker may have kind of additional bargaining power in the second period if they acquire some firm specific skills during the first period but this is mainly just meant to keep things simple and emphasize kind of the, the role of the information sharing. So maybe you will say this next, but um, can you clarify the informational assumption? So given your point two, it's clear that the uh, wages in the first period that either party may offer are not directly observable, except at the information sharing stage, mm -hmm. which you are going to define mm -hmm. now. 
How about the responses to the wage offers? Those are private as well. So, so in particular, yeah, what I, I'll oh, you will say that. Okay, good. Um, I'll say shortly what I what exactly I mean by information sharing. So it, it can, can be I different. Ask a quick question. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your answer. No, I thought it was done. Um, the one thing I was confused about in the paper, and again, I don't know if it's the right time to ask this question, but why do we have two rounds? in period, like what's the significance of two rounds in period one, one round in period, like why couldn't we do this model with one round in period? So it could be one round in period one. I mean, then the worker would make a take it or leave it offer and maybe rejected. It's kind of mm -hmm. just for interpretation. So it's a bit weird to interpret workers who aren't employed at the firm, observing wages of workers who are. I mean, I'd like to think about this as kind of information sharing between coworkers. Um, but I mean, that's purely for interpretation. So kind of formally that it could be a take or to leave it offer in the first round as well. I see. So round two just makes it so people, everybody's employed in equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. So what exactly is this information sharing or transparency? So I'm just gonna assume that between the first and second periods, worker I might observe worker J's wage with some probability, row I, J. Yeah. And so just the, just the agreed upon wage is observed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here everyone's gonna be employed. So, so that's kind of, everyone will have some wage. So that's the only thing that can be observed and it's observed with that probability. So whether yeah. that wage was agreed after these two rounds or in the first round, that is not yeah. observed ever. That's not, yeah, that's not observed. Okay. Um, so, I mean, some of uh, this isn't kind of crucial, but but for now, yes, that, that's all that's Yeah, all yeah, I'm asking just to know what we are assuming. So, yeah. I, I, fine, thanks. All right. So, these links between I and J can be, you can think of them as directed so or undirected. So, undirected would be I observes J if and only if J observes I. This is an important kind of information is always going to flow one way. What I am going to assume here is that these links are independent. So, whether or not I observes J, is independent of whether or not I observes K. And this I'll maintain throughout. So now we can turn to what equilibrium looks like in this game. So is the model clear so far? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm gonna restrict retention to pure strategy PBE with one kind of ad hoc refinement, which I'll discuss on the next slide. So first kind of preliminary lemma, really more of an observation. So I'm gonna assume there's a minimum wage of S prime. So some minimum is needed to prevent the firm from in the second period offering negative, or asking for negative infinity or negative D if that's the worker's outside option. Um, and having the minimum wage of S prime is just gonna be convenient. So under this assumption, each worker adopts one of two first period strategies. So the workers, you're either gonna pool, which means they're gonna offer, make an offer of S prime, which both types of the firm will accept, or they're gonna screen, which means they're gonna make some higher offer that they expect only the high type firm to accept. Now, if that offer is rejected in the second round, the firm is gonna make an offer of S prime, whether it's the low type or the high type. Screening here is possible because the high type has more to lose by delaying agreement in the first in the first period. So, because of the discounting, that that's that's kind of the, where we're able to get some separation. So, in the second period, a worker who knows the firm's type will demand kind of the entire output, and a worker who does not know, know the firm's type is either going to demand the high uh, wage of S double prime or a wage of S prime, depending on what their beliefs are about the firm's type. So here's kind of the analogy to experimentation. So pooling, you can think of as the safe arm. So there's no risk involved. The worker gets a fixed wage, but doesn't learn anything. And screening here is risky. So if the firm is the low type, then the worker actually delays their, their agreement and gets a lower payoff, but they may get some information from screening. But of course, the kind of their the cost of, of screening, or in particular, kind of the, the wage that they can get if they try to screen, is going to be endogenous.
let me just clarify then what the, what the inferences that workers are gonna make are. So this is the kind of refined, the only refinement that I'm making here. I'm assuming that a worker who sees a wage above S prime is always gonna assume the firm is a high type, even on path. So in particular, if the worker sees a wage of S prime from some worker who they expected was screening, on its own, that should indicate that the firm is a low type, kind of off path. But if the worker also sees some other worker that got a high wage, they're going to assume that the firm is the high type. Yeah. So this, I think, is intuitive. Sorry, sorry. I, I got confused. So S prime was the low wage, right? Was the minimum wage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, S prime is the minimum wage and also it's, it's the- It's the pooling one, right? Yeah, it's the pooling wage and it's the value to the low type firm or the mm -hmm. output at the low type firm. And so, so what are we saying? A worker who sees a wage above, oh, above sorry, I thought oh. of S prime. Okay, okay. <laughs> very good, thank you. Yeah. So basically, okay, a, a wage is strictly above S prime, always assume, okay, good. I thought yeah, you yeah. meant the wage of S prime, thanks. Yeah. Right, yeah, so the idea is it's kind of regardless of what the low type firm believes about what will happen in the continuation game, it's never gonna be optimal for them to accept the wage above S prime. And we, can ju we could justify this with some type of forward induction arguments, but let's just take it as a reasonable restriction. So given this, the kind of inferences made by the worker on path are gonna be characterized by this screening set C, meaning the workers who are supposed to screen in the first period. So any worker who observes a high wage, a wage above S prime, learns that the firm is the high type. Now, if the worker observes some, some screening worker who gets a high wage, I mean, they'll also infer that the firm is a high type, if they observe a screening worker who gets a low wage and they get no other information, then they'll assume the firm is a low type, kind of their on path inference. If they observe a screening worker who gets a low, low wage, I'm um, sorry, if they observe a, a pooling worker, so a, a non screening worker who gets a low wage, then they're going to make no inferences. So they expect that both types would have accepted the, the low wage offer of this worker. So this, this comes from the uh, pure strategy assumption, right? Like if mm -hmm. there's, yeah. you can identify who's the pooling and who's the screening worker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this- I see, I was going to ask the same. So you're, the, you're not observing whether the worker decides to screen or not. You know that in equilibrium. That's you know that you in mean. equilibrium. And that's because of pure strategies. Yeah, yeah. So it's gonna turn out that this won't actually matter whether you know the, the screening set or not. Um, but, but, but at this level, yes, your inferences depend on the fact that you know who is supposed to screen. And the reason why you don't want workers to be observing that directly, namely to not be observing the offers that they make, is it for interpretation or does the model change in that case? So, so no, I, I could allow them to, to observe kind of the say the entire bargaining history. In which case you don't need this pure strategy assumption. In which case you won't need the pure strategy. So some other things may change. So I wanna be cautious in saying kind of how right. much we need the pure strategy. Yeah, you might have other equilibrium in particular, yeah. but okay. Um, and I do discuss a little bit kind of how workers may benefit in fact from, from right. the strategies. I mean, kind of the intuition is right. you want, you may want to kind of delay information revelation on the part on the part of the firm, so it may be helpful, in fact, for the workers to not kind of allow the firm to not reveal as much information early on, and you can do this through mixed strategies. But but I'm going to be talking about pure strategies. Okay, thanks. So the real question here is is what screening sets can be supported in equilibrium, and what initial off wage offers may be made by the workers who try to screen, right? So this is kind of gonna characterize entirely what's going on in this equilibrium. So before we kind of really get into it, a quick preliminary result. So if a worker, if when a worker has a belief P, meaning their prior, in the second period wants to ask for a high wage, then there's gonna be a unique equilibrium and this is going to entail no screening. So this is kind of a statement about what workers would do in the second period, conditional on retaining their prior. Okay. Um, so I don't think it'll be too helpful to kind of get into the details of this unless anyone's really interested. 
the, the important implication is that I'm going to just maintain the assumption that at the workers prior in the second period, they'll ask for a low wage. And this is where their kind of outside option comes in. So this is always gonna be true providing their outside option is, is bad enough. So this negative D is, or D is sufficiently large. So that was the worker's outside option. The important implication of this is just that a worker who proposes, um, a worker proposes a high wage in the second period, if and only if they observe some other worker who gets a high wage in the first period. And otherwise they're gonna propose a low wage in the second period. So we're just kind of ruling out the case in which the unique equilibrium involves no screening. So, I see, so, but why can't you get this just from, you wonder in the second period, if my belief is the prior, I'm not going to screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why can't that be a statement about P being low enough? P is the probability that the firm is the high type, right? Yeah. So if I have a zero outside option, I can get something from pooling, right? I get S prime is strictly positive. I, I don't yeah. know if you assume that or not. Then why can't I make that simply assume that P is low enough? Because the P is also going to affect what I want to do in the first period. And so I see. Kind of in order to make sure that we can have interesting things happening in the first period, while also ruling out, while also ensuring that interest, I mean, that there can be screening by ruling out the fact that the worker will ask for a high wage in the second period at their prior. I it's see, if B, have, if B is low enough that I don't want to screen in the second period even my prior, then things are going to be an interesting in the first period as well. Yeah, yeah. I see, okay, thanks. But, so this, this is kind of strange, right? Because if, if P goes high enough, um, I, I'm thinking about P as the probability that it's a high type work, high type firm. Wouldn't this mean that you want to, like in the first period and set, you want to make an offer towards a high, a high wage, right? Because you think it's likely to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and then that would screen, right? So I, yeah. I, I feel like screening incentives are increasing in P. Maybe this is yeah, just yeah. me not screening understanding. Incentives are increasing in P, but I don't want you to screen, I mean, to ask for a high wage in the second period, because uh -huh. otherwise we're going to get nothing interesting. And so that's why I want P high enough that something interesting can happen in the first period. But I don't want. Yeah, I guess the question is why is P high enough? Why is the wage of S double prime in the second period, um, given the prior, mean that mean that nothing interesting happens? Because after if screening happens in the first period, then wages could be different in the second yeah, period yeah. depending so, on the information. So it's not entirely obvious why this is the case. Um, uh, but I don't really want to want to kind of get into the details. Okay. So if you want, okay. you can, this is kind of just justifying this assumption. If you want, forget about the lemma where I'm just, let's make this assumption. And the, the, the implication is this. So, I mean, we can kind of move forward just remembering this implication. That's kind of really the important piece. Okay. So workers are going to ask for a high wage if they know the firm is a high type and a low wage otherwise in the second period. Okay. All right, so now we can really kind of get into the analysis. <clears throat> so the, the important object here is gonna be the firm's payoff conditional on who they allow to, to screen. So this pi A C omega is the total payoff to the high type firm from period one on when the workers in, in C screen and other workers pool, the screening offers made by workers in C are given by omega. And the firm accepts all and only these screening offers from some set A. So they reject the screening offers of C not A and will then in the second period, in the, in the second round of the first period, propose a low a wage of S prime. The firm's always gonna accept all the initial offers of the pooling workers. So kind of nothing interesting happens there. Right. Kind of the first main result is that this function is supermodular. Right. And it's gonna be strictly when we have kind of imperfect information sharing. And so this is generally the case we're gonna focus on where 
information sharing is not perfect. Right. So let me give you intuition for this supermodularity. So let's say we have some screening set C and a set A, which is smaller than B and some I, which is in neither of these sets, A or B. So I wanna consider the kind of the reasoning, the incentives of the high type firm to reveal itself to I by accepting a, a high offer from I, conditional on either revealing itself otherwise only to workers in A or revealing only to workers in B, the larger set. So supermodularity of the firm's payoff is, is essentially saying that the benefit to revealing the, for the firm of revealing itself to I, so accepting I's offer, is higher in scenario B when more other workers are screening successfully. So why is this the case? Well, there are really kind of three factors to consider. So first let's consider kind of factors related to the information revealed by worker I, if I screens. <clears throat> so notice that the firm is not concerned about I informing a worker J if J is screening successfully. That is if J is on its own learning the firm's type. And so when the firm is revealing itself to B, there are fewer workers who remain uninformed than when the firm is revealing itself only to the set A. And so it's less costly to, to allow I to screen in scenario B. Moreover, observations from multiple workers are substitutes. So in particular, if a worker observes two high wages, then I mean, the second one is redundant. And so when the set B of workers is screening, I is less likely to provide pivotal information to any of the workers who remain uninformed than when only a set A is screening. Okay. The final factor concerns the information revealed to I. So suppose the firm rejects I's initial offer, so it tries to mimic the low type in its negotiations with worker I. Well, I is more likely to observe at least one wage from set B than from set A, since B is larger than A. And so the value of lying to I or mimicking the low type is lower in scenario B. Okay? And so all these forces go in the same direction. So the firm is more willing to let I screen when the larger set of workers B is also screening. Okay. So now, Pizza, oh. could I ask a quick question? Yeah. So if I just think about the, the simple intuition behind it, this is all about the kind of transfer of information, right? That yeah. the bigger the set, the more likely information is going to be transferred anyway. Yeah. And less likely I, the firm, am able to uh, uh, prevent that. So anything that would go against this would be a problem for this result, right? So for example, if in smaller groups, people feel more, and obviously I'm making behavioral shit up here, yeah. but is an assumption, um, people fear more comfortable camaraderie to exchange information. And in larger groups, people kind of feel more of a, I, I shouldn't be talking to people, it's less personal, then this would fall apart. Um, I mean, so it depends what you mean by the group. If, if by the group, you mean kind of the entire set. So this right. set, right. calligraphic big, W. Sets, bigger sets impose some sense of, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to remain anonymous. I'm not supposed to talk to people. Smaller sets, I feel, in, in other words, I'm, I'm tr I guess I'm endogenizing the probability of transferring. And then it just is a question of how different social environments motivate or demotivate transferring information. So, I mean, for any, no matter how large we make the set, the set of workers, this result holds. So I guess the idea would be if my willingness, my interest in sharing matter depends on how many other workers I expect in equilibrium to also be sharing. Yes. And if I directly that. So, right. So if more other workers in equilibrium are expected to be sharing, if that means that I prefer not to share for some mm -hmm. behavioral reason, that would go against this. Okay. Um, but I mean, kind of if, it seems reasonable actually to maybe expect the opposite. So if I know a lot yeah, of other I, I, I think are, the, I, I think the assumption makes sense. I don't I don't have yeah. I'm just trying yeah. to look at the underlying story. So to yeah, speak. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I, mean, I guess more generally, kind of what would go against this? Because I think that kind of the intuition behind this is fairly robust. So I've given you kind of a, a specific game, but this is really about kind of the firm's rep wanting to preserve its reputation in some sense and how its incentive to preserve its reputation depends on what information it's revealing to other workers. So yeah, I think it's an interesting question. What, what exactly would, would, would go against this? I mean, just, just one quick uh, question. I mean, uh, one, one possibility could be that the information is not a substitute, okay? Because in, in your example, I mean, one positive signal, okay, is sufficient to learn the state. Yeah. But, but that hinges a lot on the assumptions of the information structure. I mean, you can come up with other information structures that display exactly the opposite property. So, so it is true that here I have one is all you need to observe the state. On the other hand, kind of the firm doesn't know what observations will realize. And so what, what matters for this result is kind of the firm's ex ante perception of how likely a worker is to become informed. And the idea is that, that that function in particular, so here in this case, kind of the probability that worker I becomes informed is the probability that I observes at least one wage from the set of workers who are screening. That function is submodular and that submodularity, and so it's submodular given the assumption of these independent leaks, that submodularity is really the important piece. And so even if kind of one signal doesn't fully reveal the firm's type, as long as you have this type of submodularity, which is related to substitutability, you will get this. Yes. But yeah, but, but I'm thinking. Yeah, if, but I'm thinking of other information structures that have display complementarity yeah. rather than substitutability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, then that would uh, this could be. You say I have a, I have a question. So yeah. uh, the I understand everything you said about complementarity here, talking about the firm's incentive to reject I's offer, given that he's accepting uh, A versus B. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not understanding why we're thinking about these kind of unilateral deviations for the firm, right? Like why can't, why is not the relevant deviation to reject all of their offers, uh, versus. So we'll get there. One? I think, I think we'll get there in a second. I hope, hopefully. Okay. So, I mean, we need to understand kind of the firm, the way the game works, the workers all make their, their initial offers and the firm sits there and decides which ones to accept or reject, uh -huh. it, could, it could accept any set that it wants. And so that's right, right. here, we're just understanding these payoffs. Okay, yeah. so it will become relevant why yeah. this unilateral consideration is relevant. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so kind of going in that direction. So <clears throat> we're gonna wanna think about the payoff to workers of deviating. And so this, Chi I is going to be the set of screening offers that the firm might accept conditional on rejecting I. Right? So that's conditional on rejecting I. So this is exactly kind of in the sub game where the firm has rejected I, who will it want to accept? So it could be that in particular, this will be if, if I deviates and asks for a higher wage and the firm rejects that, this is who it, it will, the firm would accept. But it's also who, who the firm would accept actually if I deviated and tried to pool. So just ask for a low wage. Kai is gonna describe, describe what would be optimal for the firm to do in that following I's deviation. It's not a sub game actually, right? Sorry? It's, I mean, actually the rejections are done or acceptances are done simultaneously, right? So this is a, a sub game in the thought experiment but not in the timing you described, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Yeah, 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 I had the same they're, question. They're you're done, talking. They're done simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah. you are still talking about the first round of the first period here. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit confusing to yeah. think about these deviations. Um, but let's keep going and see where we're going. Okay. So I mean, the idea would be. Yeah. So here I'm just saying. I mean, you can define that this is conditional on rejecting I. Who would the firm want to accept? So here's where we're, where we're going with this. So assuming imperfect information sharing, if C and omega characterize an equilibrium, then these two conditions are gonna hold. So first the firm is going to be indifferent between accepting all of the screening offers 
and rejecting all of the screening offers. And second, conditional on rejecting any screening offer, the firm will be willing to reject all of the screening offers. Okay. Right, so what are these saying? So this first part is really specifying kind of which incentive constraints bind for the high type firm. So in theory, the firm can accept or reject any subset out of C. Right? And clearly at, kind of at least one of these incentive constraints must bind. So this theorem tells us exactly which. I mean, it's always the case that at least this, this one incentive constraint binds, accept all or, re or reject all. Okay. And part two is gonna concern the firm's kind of off path strategy. So this says that the firm is always willing to reject all screening offers following a deviation by any single worker. So I'll come back to a second one, like what the implications of this Sorry, are. Sorry, can, can you repeat the second one following a deviation from what? So, so, if, so, <clears throat> right. so it must be the case that if a, if a worker, if a worker I deviate, say by asking for a higher wage, it must be that if I ask for a higher wage, the high type firm rejects. So that, that, the, that the equilibrium strategy of the high type firm specifies reject. So, so I'm not, deviating again, what is the equilibrium? Deviation. So I, yeah, I find very confusing the way we discuss deviation. So what is the equilibrium we are trying to sustain? What, what am I deviating from? So if, so if C and omega characterize an equilibrium, meaning in this okay. equilibrium, workers yes. in C are proposing init making initial offers given by o the vector omega. Where omega can be pooling or screening. So omega is representing the offers of the workers in C. So these are the ones who are screening. Workers ah, not in C are pooling. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, okay, good. Okay. So then you're saying if a worker deviates from that omega. Yeah. A worker in C deviates from that omega. Yeah. So, okay. so if they ask for, for a lower, still above S prime, then the firm would, would, would accept it, but that's never gonna be relevant. So what's really relevant is whether the worker deviates and asks for a higher wage or deviates to S prime to, to pooling. I see. Okay. So this is another way to, to say that the firm either will accept or reject all. Is that correct? Yes, but it's kind of off path. So conditional on ID. So the first statement is, is no workers have deviated. The firm is just deciding which ones to accept or reject, what incentive constraint binds. And now we're saying, suppose a worker deviated, what would the firm want to do in that case? So they're, they're closely related, um, but they're not exactly okay. the same. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, right, so given an equilibrium, this XI is gonna describe the set that the firm accepts if I deviates. Okay. So this is, I mean, this is a description of the firm strategy. Okay. We just observe that if, so one implication of this theorem is that if this C omega characterizes an equilibrium where this XI is not empty for some I, there's also gonna be an equilibrium with C and omega and where this set is empty. So additionally, you know, C omega such that this set must be empty are in a sense generic. Um, so I won't get into the details of that in the interest of time. But the point is, so I'm gonna, I wanna kind of, kind of focus on this type of equilibrium. Um, and in that type of equilibrium, the payoff to a worker from deviating is independent of the degree of transparency. So they know that if they deviate, everyone will get rejected they will not get any information. So I'm just conscious of time. So let me just kind of say what, kind of a couple of reasons why this result is important. So from a technical perspective, this first condition is gonna pin down in particular kind of the sum of the wages with which workers screen. The second condition is gonna limit the degree of dispersion of the wages of workers who try to screen. And so we can jointly use these, these, use these conditions to relate these information sharing parameters to what wages could arise in equilibrium. Um, now, this also implies that for the firm, the payoff from their best deviation, so their best deviation being reject all, doesn't depend on information sharing. So the payoff, this payoff to the firm is independent of what transparency looks like. 
And similarly, for all workers who screen, their payoff from deviation doesn't depend on information sharing under this assumption that Xi is equal to the empty set. This is also gonna have kind of more practical implications. So for example, for studying welfare, so the firm's payoff and aggregate worker welfare aren't gonna depend on, on the degree of transparency directly. So the degree of transparency may, de may determine what screening sets can arise in equilibrium, but conditional on a given screening set arising in equilibrium, the payoffs will be independent of transparency. Okay. And the firm's equilibrium payoff is always decreasing in the set of workers who screen. This is also gonna imply in fact that pooling workers in this model with symmetric workers are always better off than screening workers. The idea being pooling workers can deviate to screening, but if a, if a screening worker tries to deviate to pooling, they will get no information from other workers. So their payoff would be worse than the workers who are supposed to pool in equilibrium. And finally, we're gonna study the kind of the implications of this result for the anti-discrimination policy and redistribution. So let me kind of quickly illustrate this in a picture and then I'll skip a few, um, I'll skip the discussion of the proof of this result and I, cause I wanna get some time to discuss discrimination. But just to kind of build some understanding of this result. <clears throat> so let's think about set, setting with two workers. Let's imagine there's no transparency, or otherwise these, these are isolated negotiations. So W tilde is gonna be the wage at which one could screen in isolation. Okay. Now imagine that there's transparency and worker two is not screening. So this W of row two one is the wage at which one could screen, the highest wage at which one could screen, conditional on two not screening. So this is gonna be lower than W tilde because since two isn't screening, the firm is concerned about one informing two. We can do the same thing for worker two. So in equilibrium, it can't be that any worker, so for example, worker one, screens at a wage below W of row two one. So in such a situation, they could ask for a higher wage the firm would accept that even if it was rejecting two's offer. And so it would also accept that conditional on accepting two's offer. This is given the supermodularity. <clears throat> now this line represents the wage pairs at which the firm is indifferent between accepting both and rejecting both. And this must be satisfied in equilibrium. Why? Well, suppose we were in somewhere kind of in this quadrant, but strictly below this line. So there the firm strictly prefers accepting both to rejecting both. Right? Well, then any worker could deviate up. If a worker deviates up, they know that suppose the firm rejects their offer. Uh, suppose, yeah, suppose the firm rejects their offer. Since we're above W row one two and W row two one, the firm will also reject the other offer. And so the relevant payoff for the firm, if, if one of them deviates is to reject both but here the firm strictly prefers accepting both to rejecting both. So we have to be kind of on this frontier. Right? So on this frontier, the high type firm would, would accept both and rejects any deviation and neither worker can deviate by asking for a higher wage. So what I'm not describing here are the incentive constraints of workers or that workers prefer screening to pooling or the incentive constraints if there were more than two workers of the pooling workers. So it must be that pooling workers don't want to try to screen. So those aren't depicted here. But notice here that kind of, if both workers in isolation wanted to screen, then there's also gonna be an equilibrium where with transparency, they both screen in particular at this point, that's gonna be an equilibrium. Because again, their deviation payoff in the game with transparency is the same as in the isolation game, since they know that if they deviate, screening breaks down, they get no information from the other worker. So that, that'll be an equilibrium. But we can have redistribution. So this would be redistribution to worker one or redistribution to worker two. So for example, in redistribution to worker two, the high type firm is willing to accept a higher wage from two, then it would be willing to accept without transparency. Now this may not be so surprising because if the firm rejects say worker, worker two's offer and continues to accept one, 
there's a possibility that two observes one. So intuitively kind of that transparency makes the rejection less attractive. What's more surprising is that one is willing to make a lower wage than they would be able to get without transparency. Because kind of conditional on two screening, one getting a higher wage doesn't affect information received by two. So why can't one ask for a higher wage and get, get a, at least the wage they would get with no transparency? And I mean, one way to understand this in terms is in terms of kind of the punishment to one from deviating. So suppose that the firm somehow could commit to rejecting two's offer if one were to deviate. Well, then if one deviated, since one must be above the wage um, W of rho two one, one knows that they will be rejected, conditional on two being rejected. It's kind of what the fragility result implies is that actually we don't need any kind of commitment on the part of the firm to enforce this, this punishment. This punishment must be optimal for the firm in equilibrium. So the fragility is really important for giving us the, the ability to get this redistribution. Um, so this is just kind of some comparative static. So these, if we increase, for example, row one, two, or if we decrease row one, two, <clears throat> then we can get less redistribution to one. This is just saying that these two kind of, these two points are the only points where actually we could have the firm accepting one worker conditional on rejecting the other. Let me skip this. Let me skip the proof here. Let me just note that kind of, I just I want to be able to say something about um, discrimination. Let me just note, this is the result I said about you know, the, the wages that workers can get from screening. So this says that the, the average wage that workers can get from screening is increasing in the set of workers who screen. So there's kind of, this is the, on the worker side, this is the manifestation of the complementarity in screening. So I'm afraid I'm gonna skip through this. Yeah, I know you're in a rush, but can I ask one question? So yeah. um, the complementarity, does it, am I right in my understanding that if all workers are symmetric, that is the, the probability of being informed just depends on the number in the screening set. Uh, if it's uh, an equilibrium to screen, you know, one agent, then it's an equilibrium to screen all agents. Is Correct. That case? Correct. And that's actually the one where the workers the most prefer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that yeah so actually, it's kind much? of related to this point. Yeah, I see that. So, so to what degree is that true with heterogeneity as well? Is it like a lattice structure or... So it's true that kind of independent of the degree of transparency. So whether it's whether or not it's worth it for workers to screen in the isolation game with no transparency. So suppose it is for every worker to screen without transparency. Now, whatever the these information sharing parameters are, it's still the case that the best equilibrium would be all workers screening. And indeed, mm -hmm. there will exist an equilibrium in which all workers screen, independent of what these information sharing parameters are. Um, but there may be other equilibria. So there's always going to be one in which workers, all workers screen. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be, in particular, I mean, suppose this information sharing parameters are kind of very high. As long as these are high enough, there's always going to be an equilibrium in which no workers screen as well. If, all work, if no workers are supposed to screen, anyone who deviates is going to bear a very high cost because they may potentially inform many other workers. And, and there can be kind of intermediate equilibria where some kind of interior set screens. Perhaps going back, I mean, you, we can chat about this when, when you uh, finish, but perhaps going back to Steve's comment, you might be able to say something with regards to the size of the set of agents. Yeah. Um, given what you just said, right? This seems yeah. that could be related to the size. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so for example, like if we add agents who for some reason pool, kind of maybe they're behavioral agents and they don't, they don't want to screen, this is gonna make all the screening agents worse off. So that we can, it's kind of easy to see these types of comparative statics. Um, right, so let me just note that kind of in this, in this setting, the first best is implemented with no transparency. So if there, as we said, if there's an equilibrium with screening in the isolation game, 
there'll be an equilibrium with screening. <clears throat> right, so then we, we, there will be an equilibrium with screening in kind of no transparency. <clears throat> so, but there, if we add transparency, there may be other equilibria. Um, but we can always get the first best all workers screening with, with no transparency. So this raises the question, I'm gonna, what, is the, what is the use of this transparency? Perhaps it's to help with discrimination. And we'll see that in fact, that will be the case. So again, I'm gonna go kind of quickly through this, but the idea is to try to understand the interaction between transparency bargaining and anti-discrimination. So this is a very stylized model, so I won't claim to be fully, fully providing real, real tight policy recommendations, but hopefully this will give us some insights. And it, clearly these, are, these factors are linked in the policy debate. So the high level intuition here is, suppose there's some set of workers against which the firm discriminates. So we're gonna to wanna to use penalties to prevent discrimination. Now, given this fragility result, we know that even without any penalties, in equilibrium, the high type firm is willing to mimic the low type in its negotiations with all workers. So now, if the high type mimics, mim mimics the low type completely, all workers get a low wage, we probably can't say that the firm has discriminated. I mean, it's gonna be hard to punish the firm in that case for discrimination. And so therefore the penalties for discrimination aren't gonna affect kind of this relevant deviation for the firm. And this is gonna limit the effectiveness of penalties in influencing the firm's behavior. The conclusion here is gonna be that kind of passive anti-discrimination measures are not gonna be sufficient. So we're gonna need more active interventions. Let me skip this, this background. Um, I'll just illustrate kind of the main ideas here in a picture. So the, the, the main result in this section is that <clears throat> the penalties for discrimination. So if we, this L represents how much the firm has to pay if they're kind of caught discriminating. Increasing this penalty will never eliminate equilibria. So in particular, we can't get rid of bad equilibria in which there is discrimination by imposing a penalty. So let me just, yeah, let me just go to the picture here. <clears throat> so the idea is, again, without, let's suppose that kind of worker two is, is discriminated against. So think of this at this stage, you can think of it as kind of taste-based discrimination. So the firm, for some reason, dislikes worker two or thinks that worker two is less productive than worker one. This may not be true, but, but since the firm thinks worker two is less productive, it's more willing to delay agreement with two. And thus, without transparency, two gets a lower wage if they try to screen. That's why this W tilde two is lower than W tilde one. <clears throat> now with transparency, we can get redistribution here, this L is the penalty that the firm must pay if they reject two, if they reject two's offer, but accept once. So that's a, case, that's a case of discrimination. Two has gotten been forced to get a low wage, even though two asked for a higher wage, and one has gotten a high wage. And so kind of, if that happens and two observes this, the firm is gonna pay this penalty L. Okay. The important thing here is that this kind of, this wage, the wage at which one is, the firm is willing to allow one to screen, conditional on rejecting two, is gonna be decreasing in this penalty L. It becomes more costly for the firm to allow one to screen, conditional on rejecting two. And so that will be the effect just of increasing the penalty, will be to change this, this move this W1, which expands the set of possible equilibria, but doesn't eliminate any potentially discriminatory equilibria. So what we can do to benefit two is increase this penalty, increase the probability that two observes one and lower the probability that one observes two. In particular, in this case, I've lowered the probability that one observes, observes two to zero. Okay. So these would be the set of potential equilibria. But notice that we haven't been able to even fully eliminate discrimination in that case. So there's still some discrimination occurring here. Two is getting a lower wage than one at all these equilibria. So how could we eliminate those? Well, somehow we would want to increase this W2 above W tilde two. Right? Now that's that not possible with the tools we have at hand because the lowest we can make this row is zero, in which case we're in this situation. So what do, how can we do this? Well, what we wanna do is 
conditional on rejecting one, we want to, the firm to accept a wage from two that's higher than what they would accept from two without transparency. So the solution, how, do we, how can we get this? We can kind of invert the lawsuit and reward the firm for anti-discrimination. So what we want is we reward the firm if worker I, so in this case, worker, the discriminated against worker, so worker two, gets a, gets a high wage and they observe that the other worker, kind of the non-discriminated against worker gets a, um, gets a low wage. Sorry, so this should be, so that should be a S prime. So this, that, there's a typo here. So this should be S prime. So we want kind of observations of inverse discrimination to be rewarded. These aren't gonna occur on path necessarily. So if all workers are screening, this never occurs on path, but this kind of off path reward is going to allow for greater redistribution towards the discriminated against worker. And so the key idea is that we can use these to facilitate redistribution, but we need transparency in order to do so. Um, so I think I need to wrap up, but I mean, kind of one takeaway here is that if the concern, if there's no discrimination, then the first best we can implement uniquely with zero transparency. But with discrimination, transparency can help redistribute towards the discriminated against group. Right? And this redistribution can be facilitated if we kind of reward this anti-discrimination. So <clears throat> this is just a recap of what I've done today and the general takeaways. And given that I'm out of time, let me just kind of leave this up and, and take any questions. So thanks and sorry we rushed at the end there. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, first, uh, Daniel and Marina, I don't know if you have any comments or questions, and then we can uh, ask the audience. I had a, I had a couple of uh, questions. Uh, yeah. Marina, you can go first. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. It was broad level, go ahead. That was what I was hoping against. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, so I just have two kind of like annoying extensions to, that I wondered if you thought about. Mm -hmm. um, so the the reason why uh, you know in your model the the firm wants to possibly accept a screening offer and even though it's bad for uh, you know future discipline on the wages is going to be basically avoiding delay right that's the yeah. that's the whole force um, and often uh, in reality we think about that force as like losing the worker right so it would be yeah. your model without a first round period. Um, you're saying it has similar implications, but one way to take that model is to say that the worker also has, you know, a private match value with the with the firm. So mm -hmm. the uh, the value of the the relationship is not only dependent is not only common value, but also has a private value component. Mm -hmm. My intuition is that this would make, basically mean that the information is less valuable and the complementarity effect is less strong. Um, and I just wanted to ask if, if that was your intuition, if you had considered that kind of extension. So I haven't considered where the worker has private information. Mm -hmm. It's because then this kind of, it becomes a signaling game. Um, and so I, I'm cautious in saying what happens in, in that situation. But intuitively, I don't think it goes against this complementarity. So I kind of the the information costs that the firm may potentially bear from informing a given worker, and assuming kind of regardless of what the worker's private information is, if they learn that the firm is the high type, they're going to get a, they're going to demand a higher wage in the second year. As long as that type of property holds, then I think the 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 supermodularity will go through. So right, but then there's less benefit. There's less cost to accepting a. A screening offer because the information is diluted that other that other workers get because they don't know. Oh, I see. You're, I see. You're saying so the the workers, other workers who observe a high wage, may think that it's just because the the worker, that worker mm -hmm. is very productive, not because the firm is a high type. This this right. I see. I see. Um. Yes. Yeah, so this. Yeah. So this is possible. Um. 
I mean, there might be a way to get to that without having the private information, which makes things very complicated. I guess what you're yeah. saying, Daniel, is that what I learned from other workers, you know, may be different. I mean, there may be asymmetries there. Right. You could also introduce noise, I guess, would be a much easier way. You're right. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. but I think that's interesting. Actually, I think that would allow you to think about predictions, you know, where you could have outcomes where certain groups, maybe levels in an organization, you know, they get to extract a lot of rent from the firm, but then other groups uh, don't. And one would want to know, you know, what is different between these different groups? Clearly, the you know, the the uh, value of information flowing from one group to the other should be lower, kind of what Daniel was just saying. Mm -hmm. But then one would also want to know, going back to these maybe comparative statics on size or on something. I mean, you you, you characterize a lot of the supermodality, and I think that's 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 beautiful. Um, I, I, I maybe I missed it, but I don't think you have a very clear statement about the set of equilibria, or you know, in terms. Um, like, you know, if one wanted to do comparative statics, I'm still unsure about how we go ahead to analyze comparative statics, yeah. but I think that would be a very nice thing to do because then yeah. you could have predictions about what groups of workers we expect to see that they can extract value from the firm and what groups may not and why we may have this kind of disconnect between different groups or yeah. you know, maybe it's not groups in an organization, but it's different industries, whatever it is, right? We, one would want to have those sorts of predictions. Yeah. Um, my question, let's alternate with Daniel. I don't know if he has another one, but my question was more about the last part. I mean, obviously you didn't have time, um, but I, I got a little bit lost about um, the connection between the first and the second part, because mm -hmm. like your conclusion is like a very general one. I'm not sure I, I, it's very specific to what you were doing here, right? You said like, if, I, like if we, you assume that there was some discrimination, like day space, I'm not having that endogenously be generated here, right? Like the firm just wants to discriminate. And yes, transparency is going to help to prevent that, but I, that sounds like that will be true so long as I can, you know. Uh... So I think that the surprising part is that transparency can't get rid of equilibrium in which we have discrimination. So there's kind of a partial negative that- I see. Any equilibrium with no penalty for discrimination will remain in equilibrium with when we add a penalty for discrimination, regardless of the degree of transparency. Now, if we change transparency, we can we can affect kind of we can affect this redistribution across workers, but on its own, having transparency see, and adding I a see. fixed penalty doesn't help. Right, because help. this is only the transparency between the workers. Okay. Yeah. I think that was my part of my confusion. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so kind of the the intuition, right? I guess you have for what what happens with a penalty. Well, suppose we have some. We're in an equilibrium where some discriminated against worker is getting a low wage, and we add a penalty which says if this worker kind of gets a asks for a high wage is rejected, but observes that someone else get a, gets a high wage, we penalize the firm. The idea is that that penalty should help this worker demand a high wage. Right. And kind of the, the point is that actually whether or not this penalty helps is endogenous because it depends on right. conditional on this worker asking for a higher wage, what happens with the other workers? How likely exactly. is this worker to in fact observe something? Right. And so the fragility okay. implies that actually this intuition breaks down. So if the worker asks for a higher wage, the firm is just, even without a penalty, the firm would be, would reject everyone else. Right. So if we add a penalty, the firm's still going to- The reject. penalty doesn't affect that. Yeah. I see. I see. And so what was your proposed solution about rewarding? Can you repeat that? Yeah. So I can go back. So sorry, I think you can see kind of in fast. this picture. So the idea is, the idea is what does the penalty, so we can go back kind of, what does the penalty do? This, so the penalty is this L. Mm -hmm. so increasing the penalty makes it more costly for mm -hmm. the firm to, to re reject two and accept one. Mm -hmm. And that's really the only effect this penalty has. So we penalize mm -hmm. the firm if, if two gets a low wage, is rejecting, gets a low wage, but they observe that one gets a high wage. And so the pen, that's what you can see here, the penalty just kind of expands the set of possible equilibria. Right. That doesn't eliminate discrimination. Now let's think kind of if we could design the information sharing, what would we want to do? Well, we'd want to 
you know, facilitate redistribution towards two, we can raise um, row two one and raise the penalty. But in order to try to eliminate discrimination, so make sure that two doesn't get in, in, any, in any equilibrium, doesn't get a lower wage than one, we can't, it's not enough to work with transparency. So the best we could do simply working with transparency is to make the probability that one observes two zero, in which case two can get their isolation wage from screening, but they can't get anything higher. I see. So, so you need we, some sort we, of asymmetry in this, in this observability, uh, which I so guess would be very hard to enforce. I mean, so this is, this is in theory what we, the best right. we can do, even if we could have asymmetries. Mm -hmm. But it's still not enough to kind of eliminate discrimination in this region. Right. And so the proposal is to somehow make the pay, we need to increase this, this wage. In other words, we need to make the firm more willing to accept a high wage from two, conditional on rejecting one. Mm -hmm. Now that's not gonna happen on path in this case because I'm looking at an equilibrium where both screen, but still it's gonna be helpful to facilitate redistribution towards two. <clears throat> and so how do we do that? We need to explicitly reward the firm. So again, here's a, this is a, a typo. Reward the firm if one gets a high wage so if the discriminated against worker gets a high wage and they observe some other worker who gets a low wage. Right, but when you say the discriminated against worker, I mean, you're assuming that, how do I then, like from the policy perspective, what does this mean, right? Like I identify, oh. like you're assuming like some sort of statistical discrimination where I know this group of um, yeah, yeah. So are discriminated some, against. There's because some it, group not, that I He's not protect. discriminated against in this equilibrium, right? Yeah, yeah. So this yeah, is yeah. like a counterfactual idea. No, the idea is, yeah, where there's some identifiable group. So I this, see. This okay, now I understand the result. Yeah, the why is is exogenously given. This is some set at, at which against which the firm is biased, and we want to protect. I see. So we have the knowledge. Okay, now I understand the result. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. So any any questions from uh, from the audience? Okay. I was so just wondering. Oh, sorry. Oh, I just have one. Sorry, Keith. Yeah, I was just. just go on. Um, I've never thought about this deeply, but it might be natural to think in a situation like this that uh, maybe workers have private information in this kind of bargaining situation about, and you mean you? I, I realize this could be allowed for about their outside options, for example. Um, it's not completely, you know, it's not the first thing that I would think of maybe to think that the firm has private information. Now, it's true that if wage transparency is going to be interesting, it has to be that wages reveal something. So I can see how you ended up with the assumption that the, the firm has private information that can be revealed by what wages it accepts. But I still wondered whether, at least a priori, uh, the workers' private information might not be a more important consideration than the firm's. I was just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, so I mean, as you said, the reason to look at kind of this, this model is exactly that transparency should only be valuable if, if it's conveying some information that the workers don't have. Um, the question is what happens if workers also have private information, say? Um, and yeah, I'm, this, is, this is, I think, hard to say. So I, I haven't thought, thought deeply about it. it. It becomes a signaling problem, a signaling and screening problem. And, and that's kind of trickier. Because I mean, the provocative version of my question would be like, okay, like there's S, there's S prime and S double prime, but maybe they're very close together. Uh, or, maybe, or maybe, you know, P is very close to zero or one. So that, that uncertainty is not that, not that severe. Whereas maybe the worker's private information is really a big deal. That could be. And then maybe, maybe the effect you're considering here is swamped by signaling considerations. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I can allow for kind of observable worker heterogeneity, so that's a that's a very cheap answer, but but uh, and that doesn't change anything. But having worker private information, yeah, yeah, it'll... yeah. The the idea was more to try to really evaluate kind of this 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 motivation for for transparency, which is to give the workers more information about their own value. Okay, good. So I think we're right on time. So maybe we can uh, uh, we can stop the recording now.
then uh, have a informal chat. Uh, Thank you. Th thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, so, Anhil, are you going to stop it or, or can I stop it as well? I think I did. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Marina, you asked about the um, kind of a full characterization of equilibrium. So, I had kind of a partial characterization. The sorry. Oh, something weird is something happened. But... Yeah, yeah, I think we lost. <laughs> Am I? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Okay. So the 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 only kind of tricky part of the of the giving you a full characterization is the incentives of the pooling workers. Um, so these don't have kind of a, a very neat characterization. So the idea is the pooling workers. I mean, they have to prefer pooling to screening, and as I mentioned, they can always deviate to to screening. And in fact, they can do better. So because of this complementarity in screening, if the if a pooling worker deviates the screening, they can actually get an even, even higher wage than the workers who are supposed to screen in equilibrium. But they may not want to because they're also getting information from the workers who are screening. And, and screening is risky. So it's possible, I mean, it is possible for some workers to pool and some to screen in equilibrium.